We all know what consciousness is. It's what goes away when you fall into a dreamless sleep. So it's saying consciousness is not the same thing as intelligence. It's not the same thing as having language or of behaving in a particular way. It's just any kind of experience. It's not something to be taken for granted. The self is another kind of perception. If you don't know you live in a bubble, you'll never get out of it. People will disagree. For me, it's very simple. We all know what consciousness is. It's what goes away when you fall into a dreamless sleep or go under general anesthesia. It's completely different from sleep, isn't it? I mean, you, you have no idea how much time has passed. Certainly the times I've had general. You, you go under, you come back, and you're not just sort of dozing. You are just not there. Ten, it could be 10 years yeah. later. And it's, it's, um, that is unconsciousness. And yes. the flip side of that is, is consciousness. So when that's not happening, you, you are conscious. The, the philosopher Tom, Thomas Nagel puts it, I think, very nicely. He says, for a conscious organism, there is something it is like to be that organism. Like it feels like something to be you or me, probably many animals. It feels like something to be that animal. But for, for you under general anesthesia or for a table or a chair, there's nothing going on. There's no subjective experience going on at all. So that's consciousness. Consciousness is not the same thing as as intelligence, it's not the same thing as having language or of behaving in a particular way. It's just any kind of experience. What does that mean? How do you work with that? So the way I approach it is to think of three different aspects mm. of consciousness that cover this broad idea. One of them is, is level, like what happens in the brain when you, you lose consciousness entirely, like in anesthesia or in other conditions. Something that affects globally how conscious you are. Then there's conscious content, which is when you are conscious, you're conscious of something. You open your eyes and, and a world is there. It has colors and shapes and people and places and, and objects and things are happening. And how does that occur? Because the brain can take in information and respond to it without consciousness being involved. I mean, we, we can perceive things unconsciously. Not everything that, that reaches our senses we, is, uh, affects what we're aware of. So, what in the brain generates the experience of a world? And then finally, what in the brain underpins the experience of the self? Because it's, it's, it's tempting to think of the self as like, you just take it for granted. It's this, it's this mini me inside my brain somewhere that is doing all the perceiving and then deciding what to do next. But the way I think and a lot of others in this area think is that the self is not the thing that does the perceiving. It's not something to be taken for granted. The self is another kind of perception. The brain is creating the experience of self in the same way that it's creating the experience of the world. I think dividing it this way gives, gives um, certainly that's what structures the way I do my research. I try and understand these areas. They're all joined up in some ways, but you can approach them at least a little bit separately. It's, it's very easy to assume that we all experience the world the same way because our experience has that character. You know, I open, I, I'm looking at you guys now and you're wearing a, a kind of mauve purple shirt and a, and a blue shirt and it seems like that's out there in the world. Those colors are out there in the world. They're not being made up in my head. Um, and the same for everything else I'm experiencing. But that's not true, right? The, the way it's actually working is, of course, there's a real world out there. Of course, you guys are actually out there and there are, thing, there are these objects that you're sitting on and, and wearing. Um, but the way I or anybody or any animal would experience them is dependent partly on what's there, but to a large extent on what's how the brain decides to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Colors are a really good example. You, know, you take a piece of white paper from in here outside and it still looks white, even though the light waves bouncing into your eyes have changed completely. The brain takes into account all the ambient lighting in order to decide what color something should be. And the same, hap the same is true for everything that we experience, which means that we're all gonna experience things differently, even though, we, even though it seems as though we each see the world just as it truly is. And sometimes these differences can be quite large. And sometimes people see things that other people don't. You know, they start actively hallucinating. Um, or they might have what we would call a neurodivergent condition, where it's like autism or ADHD or something. So their experience of the world is quite dramatically 
different in a way that can often be challenging. But I think, and there's some evidence for this now, that, that even if you don't hallucinate actively or describe yourself as neurodivergent, we all experience the world differently. In fact, there's no sort of single true way to experience it. You know, our perceptions are, are tied to reality, otherwise they would be useless. Mm -hmm. But there's, but they're always a construction and the constructions will always differ. Quite how much they differ is something that we, we're looking at. We have this project called the Perception Census, which is a set of online little brain teasers and interactive experiments and illusions that is trying to map out this hidden world of, of inner diversity. Because you know, I think we know in society that we've come to hopefully, optimistically, cherish the externally visible diversity we have in, in sort of height and skin color and, and so on and cultural background that we can see on the outside. And so I think recognizing and learning to, to cherish the inner diversity that we have too could be equally transformational, but we just need to know what it looks like. We're all, you know, as individuals, this complicated mix of inheritance, you know, what's in our genes, development, how we grew up, the childhood experiences, the culture, the language we speak. Um, and just what happened to me yesterday is going to affect how I encounter the world and the self today. Teasing these things apart is very, very difficult, but there's some clues that, that can help us. So there's some classic studies about the effect of language that native Russian speakers distinguish more shades of blue. So you're a native Russian speaker. Mm. So probably, I mean, you know, like the, the light wave spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum is basically just a continuous set of, of light, of wavelengths. Yes. But, but our brains carve it up into distinct colors, which is why a rainbow has these distinct bands. It doesn't just look like a continuous band of color. But that's our brains imposing these categories. And it turns out that for native Russian speakers, these categories are imposed in a slightly different way. Mm. You're quite right that a lot of traditions, whether it's in, in you know, Western culture of personal development or in Eastern spiritual mm. traditions, especially Buddhism and the concept of Maya and that things are illusory in their surface appearance, there's a lot of um, a long history to thinking this way, that what we experience is a kind of projection. But what I think neuroscience is bringing to the table is instead of this being metaphorical, it's, yes. it's unpacking it literally. Like, how does this actually happen? How deep does it go? What does it mean in terms of some of our more basic encounters with the world? Just our experience of, of shape and, and color, for instance. And that's not given. That's also a projection. And what's you know, literally happening, at least you know, I think, and this is the, the idea that I've been exploring in, in my work and in the book, is that the brain is a kind of prediction engine. Yes. And instead of just passively soaking up information from the world or, or the body, yeah, the information that, that comes in is, is ambiguous, it's noisy, it's just this, as you say, this almost infinite morass of, of signals, whether it's electromagnetic radiation or sound waves or whatever it might be. The brain has to make sense of this to conjure a definite world, a world that just sort of clicks into position, it's things that we see. And so the way it does that, it has to actively interpret the information that it gets. Zooming out a little bit again, what this means is our, our experiences are not just passive registrations of an objective reality, they're always active, top-down, inside-out constructions. We actively generate our worlds.